Kyphus Kane, Choose Your Enemies, by Sandy Mitchell. Editorial Note As is usual with my periodic attempts to impose order on the autobiographical ramblings of Kyphus Kane concerning the incident in which I was involved, <clears throat> I have resisted the temptation to interpolate any comments of my own regarding the events which he describes. I've also resisted the temptation to correct his impressions where they diverge from mine, since, as the previous volumes of his remnances, Cain remains a reasonably objective observer, not only of events, but also of his own reactions to them, which, as ever, he persists in casting in the least flattering of lights. One of the supplementary sources I've been forced to quote from in attempt to fill the lance left by his habitual disregard of anything which didn't affect him personally is the published memoirs of his celebrated lady general Janet Sula, who at the time was serving in a far less exalted position in the regiment to which Cain was attached. As ever, I've endeavored to leave Cain's original wording as close to how I found it as possible, other than correcting a few ambiguities of syntax to clarify his meaning and breaking up the original somewhat indigestible mess of text into chapters for ease of reading and listening for you lovely viewers. Any errors thereby introduced are my responsibility alone, and rest are entirely Cain's. Amberly Vale, Ordo Zenos. Chapter 1 The thing I've always found most annoying about the Eldar, apart from the psychotic sadism, is their almost visible aura of patronizing smugness is their own habit of popping up where you least expect them. Like the ones who came charging out of the depths of the mine workings on Dorichia, for instance, laying down a lethal spread of razor-edged disc from their small arms as they came. Within seconds, half the troops with me were down, either diced to thoroughly... The Burrow party was going to need buckets to collect them, incapacitated beyond the point of any form of recreation, apart from uh, harsh language. Not wishing the sacrifice to have been in vain, I lost no time in diving for cover behind a comfortably solid seeming outcrop of rock. Once there, I snapped off a couple of shots from my last pistol in the general direction of the enemy trying to ignore the little sparks left by ricocheting shirikins, which seemed far too close to my nose for comfort while I did so. Where in the warp did they come from? Lieutenant Grafen snarled, more rhetorically than because she really expected an answer. Who cares? They're dying right here, Margot. Her platoon, sergeant and close friend, returned. Lobbing a frag grenade at the first group of guardians to have broken cover as she spoke. It burst in the middle of them, and the two closest promptly went down, crimson trickles leaking through the newly punched rents in their green and purple armor. The surviving members of Grafen's command squad were already returning fire with their las guns, picking off the rest of the Xenos who'd been incautious enough to attempt to try following up their initial advantage by closing to chainsaw distance. A big mistake, if you want my opinion. Which I doubted the pointy ears did. They'd obviously counted on the element of surprise to overwhelm us completely, before charging home against dazed and disoriented soldiers in no fit state to defend themselves. Which might have worked against the local militia rabble who'd been trying to contain their raids up until now. But unfortunately for them, what they got instead was battle-hearted and pit guard veterans who died for cover the moment the shooting started and immediately began giving as soon as they got. But that was the 597th for you. 
I've been fighting alongside them for the last couple of decades and seen them take on pretty much anything the galaxy had to throw at us. A handful of overconfident Eldar would hardly make them break sweat. Grafen tapped her comb bead. Second and fifth squads, circle back. We're under fire. She voxed, before turning to me for approval. With any luck, they'll catch them but from behind, and we could take out the lot between us. Good thinking, Lieutenant, I said, keeping my voice conversational, with the ease of a lifetime's practice of concealing visible signs of panic. She hadn't been an officer for long, and I suspected she was harboring doubts about her ability to manage a whole platoon instead of a single squad. But the strategy seemed perfectly sound to me, if I remember the layout of the tunnels around here correctly. But right now I'm wondering how they got here in the first place. And more importantly, whether there were any more where those ones had come from. Needs to say, I never have been anywhere near the place if I thought there was a chance of running into serious opposition which was why I decided to accompany Grafen's platoon that day. If anyone asked, I was there to see how she was getting on with her new command and provide any help she might need in adjusting to her greater responsibilities. In actual fact, it was because I got heritably tired of the Eldar's fondness for sudden aerial attacks, which had seen me dodging strafing runs by the one-man speeders our troopers referred to as jet bikes despite the obvious lack of either jets or wheels, for that matter. Almost from the moment of our arrival, not to mention the aircraft, which, though, though mercifully few, we lack sufficient hydras to defend against efficiently, and which, accordingly, were left free to maraud almost at will. Since aerial assets were strikingly ineffective, down holes in the ground, I jumped at the chance to tag along with the group sent to check the tunnels for any sign of enemy infiltration. Only to find that, not for the first time, I'd become the butt of one of the Emperor's little jokes. There's nothing on the all specs, Margot said, with a glance at the unit she pulled from one of her webbing pouches. But that hardly came as a surprise. With all the ore and the rock it was embedded in, surrounding us. Its range would be limited, at best. We'll have to do this the hard way, which tended to be her preferred option in any case. She gestured towards the tunnel mouth in front of us. Get in there and flush them out. If there are any left down there to flush, I said, already certain that there would be. In my experience, enemies only came in two quantities. Too many, and far too many and far too many was what we'd been facing here for more than a month. The Eldar had first appeared on Drachia a couple of years ago, in relatively small numbers to begin with, grabbing a considerment of freshly dug maconium before vanishing as suddenly as they arrived. The Planetary Defense Force, or PDF, was predictably slow and ineffectual in their response to the initial incursion with the inevitable result that the raiders returned in ever-increasing numbers, the planetary governor had believed the assurances of whichever members of her extended family were in charge of the local defense force, that they were able to cope, despite their complete lack of understanding the military matters, with the inevitable result that, by the time the Imperial Guard were called in to clean up this mess, the Xenos were rampaging about the place pretty much as they pleased, which meant that the 597th and I had been diverted from our planned return to Kronos and landed with a unvisible task of attempting to put a bit of backbone into defense of the place. The proper task force would have been a far better option, but with the Tyranids encroaching ever deeper into the gulf, the resources required to assemble one in a hurry simply weren't available, and until they were, we just have to be and do the best that we could on our own. I'd complained about it, of course, not expecting anyone to take a blind bit of notice, and to my complete lack of surprise, no one had. 
one of the definite downsides of my absurdly inflated reputation was the average Minitorum flunkery's apparently unshakable belief that the mere fact of my presence would guarantee victory wherever the circumstances. So, with the orders confirmed, there was nothing else for it but to get on with the job and try to keep my head down as usual. It's not going to be easy, I said as the door closed behind the administrative drone, who departed with almost unseemly haste after delivering the briefing documents, which, as usual, I hadn't the slightest intention of bothering to read. I glanced through the armory's viewport along the length of the void station's docking arm to where our troop ship, the encouragingly named Indestructible IV, was partially visible behind the bulk of an Armageddon-class battlecruiser, which, judging by the rents in its whole plating, had recently been on the wrong end of a Necron lightning arc. We've got a whole entire planet to protect, and just one regiment to do it with. We've got one... <sniffs> We've got an entire planet to protect, and just one regiment to do it with. Technically, it's not really a planet, Major Bocklaw said, glancing up from one of the data slates the scribe had left, already getting on with the job of plowing through the verbiage so Colonel Castine and I could benefit from his much more succulent and useful summary. One of the habits which made him such an effective executive officer. It's a large moon, one of a dozen inhabited ones, orbiting an isolated gas giant. So we'll be tunneling then, I said, feeling a cautious surge of optimism. For an old underhiver like me, that was pretty much as good as it got. If you ignored the murder of Zeno's trying to kill you part, an environment I felt completely at home in, knew better than the enemy, and dark enough to find somewhere to hide without anyone noticing if things went seriously ploying-shaped. Bacalo shook his head. It's a really big gas giant. More of a protostar, really. The moons are warm, then. Castine picked up another of the data slates and called up a pic of the surface of Drakia. My heart contracted, along with my stomach. Warm enough for us, Bucklow said happily, gazing at the snowfields and glaciers as though they were a gift from the Emperor. Which for Valhallen they probably were. Drakia is an ice world. That'll make a change, Castine said happily. Castine said happily. These days her red hair had a dusting of white in it, despite a juvenile treatment or two, which I'm bound to say was equally true of Bocklow and myself. Except that his was still permanently black, and mine the same nondescript hue it had always been beneath the speckling. But the cheery prospect of mucking about in bone-freezing temperatures which could kill an unprotected man in a matter of moments made her look a decade or two younger at once. And the troopers would be happy. That they will. I agreed, taking a closer look at the data slate. Despite myself, as I expected, the Adeptus Mechanicus had been busy in the first few centuries of colonization thickening the atmosphere and warming it up from unavailable to merely lethal. Not just on Drachia, but many of the other local bodies, too. What about the rest of the system? Nothing we need to worry about, Buckler assured us. The protostar and its satellites are independent of the rest of it. They have their own governor, administratum, and infrastructure. I skimmed through the relevant pages, my eyes and synapses ricocheting from the dense columns of population and tithing statistics, like a bullet from an organ's skull, and nodded, as if I grasped the fundamentals as quickly as he had. Makes sense, I said. It's just like a miniature solar system on its own, stuck out near the halo. Running things from Iron Found would be a logistical nightmare. 
That it would, Bucklow agreed, calling up a diagram of the system as a whole. The hive world around which everything else orbited, administratively speaking, that is, was less than a quarter of the way out from the star, at the center of things. The vast majority of inhabited worlds, moons and asteroids, pittering out no more than equal distance beyond that, only a few isolated void stations or chunks of worthless rock punctuated the vast gulf between their outliers and the protostar, which, for all practical purposes, might just as well have been in another system entirely. Even a Vox transmission would take a couple of hours to get there, let alone ships. I nodded. Not the more probably, I said, mindful of my own long coast to Perilia. The bore the savior pod from a similar distance out, some thirty years before, which was why we were being sent straight there. The rest of the Iron Fountain system was probably blissfully unaware of the Eldar raiders harassing their distant neighbors, and unwilling to help against them, even if they weren't for fear of attracting the Xeno's attention. We could be at least that long in the warp. Of course, if the currents of the ocean are unreality, if the currents of the ocean of unreality happen to be flowing in the wrong direction, but at least we'd get the job done when we arrived, which is more than could be said for whatever dregs of the Ironfound Planetary Defense Force the authorities there would be willing to get rid of. Do we have departure time yet? Twelve hours and counting, Barclow said. Should be long enough to get everything moved over to the freighter they found for us if we hustle. But his brow was furring even as he spoke, for which I couldn't exactly blame him. Twelve hours might sound like a long time, but when you got around four thousand troopers to hurt, along with their vehicles, weapons, rations, ammunition... Personal effects and the uh, administrations of the regimental band. It can be eaten up hellishly fast, believe me. Especially when the double-figure percentage of them have already been granted permission to disperse among whatever diversions they can find on a pressurized ration can floating in several billion cubic kilometers of track all. I'll get Sola on it, Castine said, happy to pass the buck down the chain of command to her second most senior subordinate. Good choice, I agreed. Sola had been her career as a quartermaster and retained a talent for logistics which made her positively relish a challenge like this. I rose with the best of show of reluctance I could feign. And I suppose I'd better start rounding our people up. There can't be too many bars and gambling dens on the void station this size. I still intended to make use of the many possible before we left, especially as I now had a perfect excuse to make the rounds. Good luck with that, Castine said. I send out a, gev a general recall message, but there are bound to be plenty. Who switched off their vox beads? Sounds like we got a busy night ahead of us, I said, which, although it turned out to be true, was nothing compared to the job awaiting us on Drachia, which in turn was a pale into insignificance once the true nature of the scale of the threat we were facing eventually became clear. Editorial Note since, as usual, Cain provides few details of the world he visits beyond the occasional complaint about whatever he regards as an inconvenience, the following may prove useful in filling in some of the more egregious gaps in his narrative. From Interesting Places and Tedious People A Wanderer's Wayward Book Majeville, Circa 149 M39 The Ironfound system is an interesting anomaly that 
perhaps worth a degree of attention of passing through that region of the Imperium, although a prolonged sun there can hardly be recommended. The most that can be said for it is that the views of the subsystem primary, known to the locals as Avrius, are fundamentally spectacular when seen from the surface of any of the worldlets in the orbit, although conditions on these bodies are significantly harsh to discourage all but the hardiest from lingering in the open air. The spectacle is thus better enjoyed from beyond the armories of the hostelry on the exterior of whichever hap-cluster discerning wayfarer is positioning, where it can be appreciated in comfort with a libation of amsic in hand. That said, the effort of finding one where the surrounding light sources are kept to a minimum would be amply repaid in clearer view thus afforded. Practically in the subtle scintillations of the ring system are to be fully appreciated. Like the perpetual snows of the woodlets, they acquire a dull red cast from the emanations of Avenus, which appears to flicker as it dominates roughly half of the sky, creating an uncomfortable illusion that the entire globe is on fire. Nonetheless, it remains bitterly cold, so much so that the vast majority of the population sensibly remain either in their sealed cities or toiling in the mines which riddle all the inhabited worldlets, relatively safe from the potentially lethal climate. Which of the dozen or so worlds the passing wayfarer may choose to break their journey on matters little since all essential respects, they are dreary as one another. Going back to the part where they say which appears to flicker. Whatever the atmospheric friction or its own internal purposes, Serka seems either unaware or indifferent. Chapter 2 The few exceptions I had of our new deployment were rapidly lived down to. Our shuttle hit the snow-covered surface of Drakia in a goat of steam, which turned slowly into a slick of glass-smooth ice across the landing pad, and I watched the world outside become gradually visible through the thinning mist beyond the viewport. About half my limited field of vision was occupied by the looming bulk of the hap cluster in the distance, beyond the starport periphery, a clomb or so in height, and about thrice that across. In the other direction, I could see nothing but snow, gathering in a small, gust-driven drifts, smothering the cargo containers stacked in the lee of the starport buildings and blurring the outline of the squadron of our chimeras, which had just been afloated from the previous shuttle down. The huge planet above us hung low in the horizon like a vast blood, Going back to a clomb, a kilometer, one of the Valhallen, well, ways of saying kilometer, Kane had picked up over the course of his long association with the regiment from that world. The huge planet above us hung low to the horizon, like a vast blood clot, tainting the whirling snowflakes with its own baleful hue so that the whole scene reminded me more of a forge surrounded by drifting sparks than the blood-chilling temperatures I knew be waiting for me the minute the pilot cracked the hatch. How far up the salamander? Jürgen, my malodorous and indispensable aide, rose from the seat next to mine, with as close to accuracy as he ever got. True to form, he suffered through the atmospheric portion of our descent with stoic silence and eloquent aroma, and his eagerness to get his boot soles on terra firma was palpable. Fine, I said, raising a little more slowly and adjusting my cap to a more heroic-seeming angle for the benefit of the trooper sitting behind us. 
prospect of traveling an open-top scout vehicle in the sub-zero temperatures prevailing outside was distinctly unappealing. Then I caught another glimpse of the chimeras growling in the, away outside. An inspiration struck. But it will take a while to get out of the hold. I'll hitch a lift in the command vehicle of a squadron outside and get up to speed with the deployment on the way in. Very good, sir. My aide nodded judiciously. Judiciously. As though his approval had been sought. And adjusted the last gun slung across his shoulder. Do you want to pick up your kit first? No. Just take it straight to my quarters. I said. I'll be reviewing tactics in the command center for some time. It would be worn, at least by Valhalla's standards. They'd have a port of tanner brew. They'd have a pot of tanner brewing, and I could easily contrive a reason for having got a lift with the chimeras. Would you like me to join you there? You can ask, and after a moment's consideration, I nodded. Yes, I would. I said, adding, whenever it's convenient to his evident satisfaction. Jürgen's dogged loyalty and adherence to whatever he considered his duty had smoothed any path in innumerable ways over the years, and it never hurt to show my appreciation of that, not to mention the fact that if he didn't feel practically hurried, my quarters would be a lot more comfortable by the time I found my way to them. The cold outside was, if anything... Even worse than I had anticipated. The air burning into my lungs was uncomfortably as foetid atmosphere as the forge world, although considerably less lethal in the long run, I suppose. Not that the long run would be much of a consideration if I hung about on the landing pad for long. I could already feel the chill leeching the life from my bone marrow. Everything else already too frozen to be aware of. Not that the troopers disembarking around me seemed too bothered by the lethality low temperature. On the contrary, they seemed in a holiday mood, laughing and chattering as they clattered down the ramp, a few of them turning their faces to the drifting snow, as though luxuriating in the shower. Conscious of that, I didn't get a move on. I practically end up frozen to the ramp. I began plodding towards a command command I had spotted from the inside of the dropship, easily distinguishable from its fellows by the cluster of auspex arrays and vox antennae amounted on its hull, which took me out of the lee of the grounded shuttle. The freezing wind promptly redoubled, hitting me with the force of an orgrin's fist, stabbing me with a million shards of wind-borne ice and wailing in my ears like berserker charge of Eldar banshees. Which, I suppose, was my subconscious giving me a well-developed sense of self-preservation, heads up. I know the Xenos were on Thrakia, of course. For some reason, the vast majority of their depredations had been on that... Benighted wordlet. So the comparison was a natural one, but making it recall their presence to mind and the probability saved my life. As the howling rose and pitched, I glanced upwards, catching a glimpse of three fast moving dots practically obscured by the fearing snow. Incoming! I yelled, heedless of the eardrums of whoever was monitoring my comm beat back in the command center. Hoping I could at least warn the troopers around me, not that I needed to have bothered. Most of them were already unslinging their las guns, no doubt far more used to distinguishing the sounds of an up approaching threat through the whining of a blizzard than I was. Finding that I could move fast after all, despite the strength slapping chill all around me, I sprinted for the command commander, desperate to get behind its protective armor plates before the incoming jet bikes could close the firing range. The thought of returning to the shuttle behind me flickered briefly across my mind, but the ramp was already beginning to rise. The pilot, obviously too old a hand to risk being caught on the ground unprotected, 
Then, with a roar of powerful engine, the scout salamander Jürgen had requisitioned burst out of a cargo hold flying off the end of a steeping slope, almost getting caught in a narrowing gap as it cleared the ramp. A shower of sparks, eerily similar to crimson-tinted snowflakes, swirling around me, followed in this gazed and lethal of the cargo hatch on its way through, and crashed to the ground with an impact which resonated through my boot soles, no doubt doing things to this sturdy little vehicle suspension that would have made an engine seer blasphemy had any seen it. Maybe some of them did, but I suspect that by then the attention of any in the immediate vicinity would have been thoroughly diverted by the Elder attack. Three green and purple jet bikes came howling out of the storm, swooping on the landing field like raptors spotting a scurrying rodent, strafing the area with swirling disc of Rager Ed's lethality. The Valhallans scattered, seeking what cover they could, but the majority returned fire with their las guns as soon as they found it. Apparently unpleasantly surprised by this, the Eldar broke off and circled around for another approach. Turning my head to follow them, I suddenly found myself uncomfortably exposed. The chimera I'd been heeding for gunned its engine and moved away, followed by the rest of the squadron maneuvering to intercept the marauders before they could start shooting into the mass of troopers on foot again. That some of the raiders' fire had found its mark couldn't be doubted. Here and there, patches of ice seemed redder and could be accounted for entirely by the baleful glow of the gargantuan planet hanging low on the horizon. And one or two of the lumps in the drifting snow seemed disconcertingly human-sized to my distant lack of surprise. The torso protruding from the turret of the command chimera was topped by a familiar face with a vaguely equine cast of features. The ponytail trailing from the rear of her fur hat confirming her identity, if I'd ever been in the slightest doubt. Sola, ready as always to confront the trouble, head on without stopping to access the consequences. This time, however, after a moment of eavesdropping on her command channel through the comm beat in my ear, I had to concede that she had a point. The heavy bolters and the armored personnel carriers' main turrets would be our best defense against the fast-moving aerial targets, although you'll need the Emperor's own luck to take them all down. That said, she was using the assets she had to best possible advantage, placing them on the fringes of the landing field to maximize their overlapping fields of fire, which would have been fine by me except for the minor detail of being left in the middle of a vast open space with airborne hostiles circling it, looking for a target. Which would be me, left in the open. There was a much chance of being singled out personally, thankfully, with so many other people hunkering down and readying their weapons. But I'd been in action far too often not to be aware that a stray round could be just as dangerous as one aimed by a marksman. With nothing better to do, I drew my last pistol from its holster and crouched down in the snow, waiting for a chance to take a wild pot shot in the general direction of the enemy, like everyone else, and minimizing a profile to the best of my ability. It would take even more luck to down a jet bike with a las bolt than one of Sola's heavy bolters, but the sheer volume of incoming fire would be enough to keep them from getting too close. The response to their first attack certainly seemed to have given them pause, and repeating the lesson might even be enough to drive them away entirely. In my previous encounters with the pointy-eared bastards, they had shown themselves to be cunning and resourceful, ruthless even, bloodthirsty, but with a healthy dose of self-preservation to temper that. A far cry from the unrelenting savagery of orcs or the Tau's willingness to face certain death in the name of the greater good. <laughs> if sufficiently motivated. I aim skywards, trying to track the nearest of the fast-moving dots. Thankfully, the augmented fingers which steadied my aim a little, despite the shivering shaking my body, 
like a case of the Og. Much longer out here, and the cold would finish me off before the Eldar even got a chance. Abruptly, without warning, the Eldar stopped their encircling and began to drive towards us, ignoring the whole of Bolter rounds whipping past them on all sides. Despite the best efforts of Sola's gunners, I listened to her typically clipped instructions and the rather more excited ones of the vehicle commanders for a moment before, concluding that there was nothing to be gained by my intervention. And even if there had been, there wouldn't be much I could contribute with my jaw frozen shut. Before studying my aim as best as I could, trying to keep one of the jinking flyers in my sights. Of course, pistols aren't meant for long-range shooting at the best of times, and this was far from one of those. On the other hand, more than a hundred people shooting at relatively small volume of space at the same time are almost bound to hit something, and I was pretty sure I saw a few impact flares as the howling flyer swooped nearer. Then one slipped sideways, a large and ragged hole ripped in its streamline, fearing by a couple of heavy bolter rounds. It slewed wildly in the air for a moment, its rider evidently fighting for control, then steadied and broke off, pulling away and gaining altitude. A ragged cheer came up from the troopers around me, only to die away again as the remaining pair opened fire. With a kind of numb detachment, I saw a line of snow and ice in front of me splinter into shards and crystals as a steady stream of spinning shurikens chewed into them before ricocheting away in a random direction, spreading death and injury in a widening wake behind the swooping jet bikes. None of which mattered in any case, because the line of fire was heading straight in my direction. In a handful of seconds, There'd be nothing left of me except a rapidly expanding crimson mist and a rather battered cap. Reflexively, I tried to stand and run, but my frozen body refused to respond, merely stirring sluggishly in something approximating to the right direction. Then, an engine roared, stressed far beyond its design parameters, and the salamander slewed sideways in front of me, Jürgen grinning down from the driver's compartment. He ducked just in time as a hail of deadly disc spanged loudly from the whole plating, passing just over my head on its way to chew up more ice, snow, and slow-moving guardsmen. Perfect timing as always, Jürgen, I said, hardly slurring my words at all, relying on our calm beads to communicate, as I wasn't sure if I had the energy to shout even if I could have been heard over the growling of the engine. The roar of the Chimera's heavy bolters and the crackle of five score las guns blasting away, not to mention the screaming of the jet bikes. You're welcome, Kamazar, he replied as though he'd done nothing more significant than hand me a sandwich and then gun the engine while I clambered aboard, though the open passenger compartment was an uninviting as I expected. At least it afforded some protection from the wind. And I immediately felt a little warmer, even though, intellectually, I knew I was still in danger of freezing to death. Sorry to keep you waiting, but I thought you'd appreciate a warm drink when I caught up with you. Sure enough, there was a flask of hot tanner sitting on top of my kit bag in the corner, which I lost no time in cracking open and swallowing gratefully. If anything, it was too warm still, burning my tongue on the way through, and tracing a little track of liquid lava down into my stomach. But by that time, I was past caring. You thought right! I assured him. I took another swallow on the grounds that the damage had already been done by this time, and under the circumstances I needed to be able to move more than I needed my stomach lining. The command center, sir! Jürgen asked, and I nodded through sheer force of habit before remembering he couldn't see me. If you don't mind, I said, gazing skywards in all our years. Gazing skywards. In all our years of serving together, I'd grown so used to Jürgen's robust driving style that I'd, that I could normally keep to my feet no matter what he did. But, still sluggish from the cold... 
My body didn't respond as instinctively as usual, and I found myself stumbling as he engaged the gears and slammed the throttle fully open. His usual method of starting off. I clutched at the pintle-mounted storm bolter for support, swinging it around as I regained my balance, and found one of the Eldar raiders drifting across the sights. Even before my conscious mind had registered what I was seeing, I pulled the trigger, sending a hail of explosive-tipped projectiles in the general direction. Luck, or well, the Emperor was certainly with me that day, as a volley rippled along the starboard side, either detonating with the engine or cooking off its power cells. The miniature thunderclap echoed across the landing field, audible even over the racket of all that firing, and everyone in the vicinity ducked to protect their heads from the rain of debris and dismembered pointy-eared bastard, which descended abruptly from the middle of the short-lived fireball. The remaining intact fire evidently decided enough was enough at that point and made a run for it, slotting into formation with the one of the chimeras had, had dented, which was already walling away towards the southwest, trailing smoke. Good shot, Kamazar! Sola broke in, her voice a little attenuated by the miniature Vox device in her ear. In my ear and I blatantly realized that at least some of the cheering I could hear from the assembled troopers was intended for me. She honestly had a clear view of the incident from her perch in the chimera turret, and if distance had made it look as though my lucky head had been the result of skillful marksmanship, who was I to... this booster? Same to you. I said with a wave in the direction of the returning Eldar. Retreating Eldar. The one you got won't be in any hurry to tangle with the 597th again, either. Which many... Which may have been true, but unfortunately there were still plenty of others who still had that lesson to learn. Or possibly neither. As Eldar... Techno sorcery tends not to reply on blah, 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 skipping over this line. Fuck it. Editorial note. There now follows one of the Lunce in Kane's narrative, which typically occur whenever he feels nothing of interest has happened to him personally in the intervening period. A great deal happened in the month. He so gallantly glosses over. However, so, as in my habit under these circumstances, I've attempted to fill the gap with some supplementary material. Unfortunately, as so often the case, where his period of service with the 597th is concerned, the most accessible and readable account is that of Janet Sulla, whose undeniable strategic and tactical expertise never extended to the selection of appropriate adjective, or indeed a mere one, when a handful would do. Those readers, and you listeners, whose literary sensibilities are too tender to withstand one of her attempts to beat the Gothic language into submission, will find Cain mentions enough in passing to infer much of what follows when he picks up his own narrative and then therefore skip ahead without too much loss of clarity. But those robust enough to grit their teeth and plough through on regardless will be rewarded for the perseverance with a more rounded view. The choice is yours. I know which one I would make. Uh, down below you're going to see a skip time if you don't want to hear this whole entire uh, section. Because I know I wouldn't, honestly, because this is um, one, two, three, four pages worth of notes in this little book that I'm reading. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to leave that at the end of the video. So I'm just going to literally call this the end of the video here and if you want to hear the little briefing that they did it's going to be at the 
end end of the video after the music and everything plays you'll notice it as soon as the audio quality changes to something different so in the meantime i am still sick and this is my present to you lovely youtube members people everyone that's following the channel subscribers patreon members and more people just dropping in and saying hello Thank you for all your support, your ongoing comments, likes, and being subscribed to the channel. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and whatever else you celebrate. For me, my family celebrates Christmas, so we're celebrating Christmas this year at home. At the new home that we're moving into. I'm halfway done moving, which means, come January... I will have to reorganize my recording booth. Yay. Back to the closet. Anyways, with that in mind, I have to say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support of our Patreon members, who have been paving the way for multiple books and other series to be in the making. I have four projects that I have been working on slowly and surely. Five, if you count a specific book from uh, Carthonia. <clears throat> Reckoning. Mm. Space battles are annoying to me. That's all I'm going to say. Anyways, let us say thank you to Mr. Cosman123, Kokoa, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Madrid. Fortis, Uno. Daskowski was right. Thank you for being ongoing Patreon supporters. And if you would like to be a Patreon supporter to see art that I draw, like the Chad Kyphus Kane, some not safe for work stuff, and uh, to be the first one to take vote on, well, what book and small series I should be reading next, you can at the Patreon link down below by becoming a member. I'll be opening up a, a Discord for all of us soon. If you're a Patreon member, that is. So, be looking forward to that, everyone. <laughs> you can be a Patreon member for a dollar a month if you wish to join. We play Jackbox and post memes, not safe for work stuff, thanks I hate it, and 50-50 on that. I also have different roles. For everyone that's going to be jumping in soon. This is my personal Discord server. And you're going to know which one I am because it's Imperial Fist related. Easy enough. Anyways, now that that is all said and done, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you still are. Happy holidays, and have yourself a good one. Stay safe out there. And see you in the next one. From like Phoenix on the wing, in early campaigns, grievous victories of the Valhallen 597th by General Janet Sula. Retired. 101 M42. The baptism of fire, which we received on disembarkation, was, as we'd been forewarned, an early harbinger of the conflict to come. Though by the grace of the Emperor and the inspirational leadership of Kamazar Kane, the providitious Eldar got an early taste of the defeat which became inevitable as soon as our women and men set foot on the welcoming snows of Drachia. <laughs> Had it not been for the redoubtable Kamazar's alertness and typical concern for those fortunate enough to serve with him, warning us all before carrying the fight to the enemy without a thought for his personal safety, things might have, well, have gone far worse than they did. But thanks to the Kamazar, we had an early and easy victory, which did much to swell the hearts and stiffen the resolve of the daughters and sons of Valhalla. 
a resolve which hardened rapidly to ice, inspiring all of us to do our duty without fear or hesitation. Indeed, at first, we may have even been a trifle overconfident, as the tide of battle seemed to be turning in our favor, with remarkable speed. The terrain we found ourselves in was ideal for skirmish warfare, being frequently warped in blizzards and lesser fleuries, which concealed our movements, and which enabled us to conduct a number of highly successful ambushes. Ambus... Ambush cadences. Highly successful ambushes. The last sight for many of the Eldar pirate was a Valhallan soldier raising from beneath the snow. Last gun, or utility blade in hand to strike them down without mercy in the blessed name of him on earth. Despite the optimistic forecasts of some of the rank and file, that we'd have the Xenos on the run within days of our arrival. However, I couldn't quite shake the sense of foreboding that things had been a little too easy for us, and that the tide of battle might be about to turn. Accordingly, we busied ourselves with strengthening the defenses, bequeathed to us by the local planetary defense force, which, alas, was barely adequate to the task of protecting strategically vital minds though no doubt doing the best job they could, the reluctance to engage the enemy in the open, where the attackers were most vulnerable, meant that there were many a few heavy weapon emplacements on the surface approaches, and no trenches lining them felicitate the protected movement of our reserves, which might have slowed an assault. Weary of underestimating our opponents, Colonel Castine ordered the immediate construction of adequate fortifications, which went on a space, removing the local defense troopers from the surface altogether in favor of deploying them at strategic points in the hab areas and mine itself, where their local knowledge would be utilized to its best effect. And as Kamas Arcane jokingly put it, they couldn't get in the way when the fighting starts. A piece of foresight which was to prove its worth ere long, as the Eldar made their first attack in force. I. adumbrated such a move on the part of our enemies for several days by this point, since their periodic raids had diminished in frequency to a point of apparently ceasing altogether, and the only reasonable interference was that they were about to change their tactics. A conclusion, I must be said, which was shared by Colonel Castine, Major Bucklow, and of course, the esteemable Kamas Arcane. Since the majority of the early attacks had been on the storage areas near the landing field, where the bounty of the mines was sent off-world for utilization, and much... and such further processing, as was economically unfeasible in the outer system. The stockpiles had been moved under cover where, where a chain of natural caverns considerably enlarged by subsequent ore extraction stood conveniently close to the entrance of the mine. These, of course, immediately became the pirate's prime target, and no little effort was made to secure them as far as was feasible. And, as we all anticipated, it wasn't long before the purification Xeno struck just as we had anticipated. Our first emanation, animation of trouble came as second platoon of my own company escorted a convoy of trucks to the landing field to meet with the first incoming shuttle from an orbiting ore barge. Such operations had become routine, of course, over the past few weeks, running almost around the clock. And we had no reason to suspect that this occasion would be any different. Until, that is, a squadron of elder jet bikes screamed down out of the evening sky, spitting fire at our gallant defenders. This was a tactic we'd come used to, of course. And our Chimera crews responded with adversary, laying down an impenetrable field of fire with their turret-mounted heavy bolters. 
In this, they were greatly aided by a couple of hydras requisitioned from the local defense force, whose own engine seers had provided inadequate to the task of refascinating them after they'd taken some disabling battle damage in the early days of the conflict. So far, then, we'd seen nothing out of the ordinary, a minor iteration at best. That was to change, however, as the landing chimeras took a hit to its flanking armor which killed its engine, driver, and gunner, but by the Emperor's good grace left most of the squad rending in its relatively unharmed. Who, of course, disembarked with speed, taking a fight to the enemy with all the righteous wrath it behoves us to deploy in the face of an unhallowed. That such a grievous blow was far beyond the firepower available to the swooping jet bikes became immediately apparent to me, and I swiftly dispatched 1st and 5th platoon to reinforce the beleaguered convoy, while deploying 3rd and 4th to the flanks, intending to channel the incoming raiders towards the waiting guns of the rest of the regiment. A course of action, I'm gratified to say, which Colonel Castine immediately approved, mobilizing two further companies to assist us. Further incoming fire and a break in the mild blizzard then revealed the full extent of the threat we were facing. Eldar dreadnoughts towering over the ground troops, scuttling around their feet, their weapons dealing out destruction with every stride, undaunted. The surviving vehicles retargeted the heavy bolters, ignoring the nonce of the jet bikes, which continued to hurry them like circling carrion birds, and were soon giving as good as they got, chewing away at the curious, flexible material of which these whole hell spawn monstrosities were composed of. Nonetheless, as the battle continued to rage, Kamazar's Kane's frustration at being, for once, out of the thick of fighting palpable in his Vox explorations of encouragement, the balance began to tip externally in the favor of the Xenos interlopers. For a moment, indeed. Every woman and man of us held her or his breath, preparing for the onslaught resolute in our duty and our loyalty to the Golden Throne. Until a loud huzzah, our sentinel squadron burst from the cover of the abandoned warehouses surrounding us to take the enemy by surprise in their turn. Caught between this fresh threat and the newly emboldened convoy escorts, the Eldar began to waver, only to see one of the dreadnoughts chewed to pieces by a hydra, which had followed the example of the chimeras and redirected its fire towards the targets on the ground. Strictly against standing doctrine, but under the circumstances, I felt the gunner's show of initiative was justified, if not actually commendable. That was the final straw, and the whole pack turned, retreating in remarkably good order, but retreating nonetheless. So ended the first major battle with the Eldar, but it was a victory I felt was hard won. So much so that the thoughts of how close we had come to defeat continued to worry me for some days afterwards, spurring us all on to do our utmost to ensure our ultimate victory.